And so what we want to do is to pick up from where we left off last week. And so we're going to cover a number of chapters this morning. So in the meantime, Samuel was growing up in the tabernacle, being nurtured by Eli the priest, and Samuel was now speaking to God's people on behalf of God. So as this is taking place in the subsequent years, the Philistines capture the Ark of God. Now remember, the Ark of God was in the tabernacle in the holy place. The Ark of God symbolized the presence of God. So the Israelites said, let's put the Ark of God in front of our army, and when we go out to do battle, we will be victorious. Well, that was a stupid move, because when they put the Ark of God in front of the army, all it was was easier for the Philistines to capture it. So the Philistines captured the Ark of God. And so they were in possession of the Ark of God. And once news of the battle and the capture of the Ark of God reached Eli the priest, Eli, it says, fell off his chair and broke his neck because he was that fat. He heard the news that the Ark of God had been captured in battle. He fell off his chair and broke his neck. You remember last week the prophecy about Eli was that his house would be done forever? That, that, that young Samuel and even the visitor from God said, Eli, you're finished as a priest because your family is so wicked. So Eli fell off the chair and died, broke his neck. His two sons were killed in battle when they captured the ark. Eli's daughter-in-law gave, died giving childbirth. And she named her child Ichabod, and Ichabod means the glory of God is gone. So the ark of God has been captured by the enemies. Eli the priest is dead, and his daughter-in-law names her child Ichabod. The glory of God is gone, or in other words, we're in a mess. And that was kind of where Israel found itself. Well, the ark of God was in the, um, it was in, the possession of the Philistines for seven months. And for seven months, the Ark of God was a pain in the neck to the Philistines. So the Philistines got the Ark of God, they put it on an ox cart, put it on the road back to Israel, and said, get away from us. That's how much trouble the Ark of God was for the nation of Philistia. And so anyway, after seven months of the Ark being gone, it returns to Israel. But during this time, the ark was gone, Eli the priest was dead, Samuel was leading the people, but their hearts were far from God. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2. 1 Samuel 7, 2. If you need a Bible this morning, raise your hand. Anybody need a Bible? You got one? There you go. Tony and Yo will bring you one. Keep your hand up. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2. During that time, all of Israel mourned because it seemed the Lord had abandoned them. I want you to pay close attention to the state of the people. They mourned because spiritually it seemed like the Lord had abandoned them. So let me tell you this morning, first of all, God never abandons his people. So if God seemed distant to the Israelites, the Israelites had removed themselves from God. And I'll tell you the same thing this morning. If God seems distant from you, it's because you've removed yourself from the nearness of God, not that he's distanced himself from you. God does not abandon his people. 100% of the time, God's people abandon him. And we have to see that here. We have to learn that here. And so what we see in chapter 7, verse 3, is that when the people finally had enough of their sin, of their debauchery, of their distance from God, they cried out to him. When they finally had enough, Samuel led them in revival. 1 Samuel 7, verse 3 and 4. Then Samuel said to all the people, If you are really serious, and notice what he says to them. If you are really serious about returning to the Lord, same thing's true for us this morning. If you, church, are really serious about returning to the Lord, so what does that imply to me? That some of us aren't serious about God. Some of us aren't serious about our relationship with Him. Some of us are very casual in our relationship with God. But Samuel says, if you're serious about getting yourself right with God, 
Get rid of your foreign gods. Get rid of your images of the Ashtoreth. Determine to obey only the Lord, and then He will rescue you from the Philistines. So the Israelites got rid of their images of Baal, the Ashtoreth, and they worshiped God alone. So, whatever your idols are, it's probably not Baal, it's probably not an Ashtoreth pole, but whatever your idols are, church, that stand in the way of you and you being serious with God, get rid of it. And He will draw near to you and you will draw near to Him. But leave them there and nothing good will transpire. So, they decided to give themselves over to God once again. So Samuel gathers all of Israel to a city, a village called Mizpah. And they gather there to celebrate the fact that they are giving themselves back over to God. But while they are there, the Philistines attack them. Now Samuel, he's a prophet. Samuel is a judge. But Samuel's not a military leader. But what God does through Samuel is he allows him to lead Israel's armies into victory over the Philistines. And Samuel brought victory to the nation of Israel that day. So Samuel has now defeated the Philistines. Samuel has now led the people uh, in revival, in coming back to God. And then we read in chapter 7, verse 17. Samuel continued to be Israel's judge for the rest of his life. Each year Samuel traveled, setting up his court in Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, and his home in Ramah. So what Samuel did for the rest of his life is he judged God's people. He would travel around being like a circuit judge, and he would hear, uh, he would hear issues from the people in this town, he would hear issues from people in that town, and he would resolve their conflicts. He was the judge of Israel. And so this part of the country was working well. Samuel going from town to town, judging the conflicts and the problems of the people. But in the midst of that, Israel began to get restless again. And as I said last week, godly parenting doesn't always lead to godly children. Remember Eli's sons? They were wicked, they were sinful, they were horrible children of the priest. You would think Samuel's sons would be different. But what we're going to see in a second is that Samuel's sons, who had now become judges as well, they were greedy, they accepted bribes, and they perverted justice. That doesn't sound too familiar, does it? But Samuel's very own flesh and blood, they were greedy, took bribes, and perverted justice. And so the elders of Israel, Samuel was judging the elders of Israel oversaw the spiritual side of things. The elders came to Samuel. And look with me, 1 Samuel 8 and verse 1. 1 Samuel 8, 1. Look now, you are old, Samuel, and your sons are not like you. Your sons are not godly like you are, Samuel. Your children are not righteous like you are, Samuel. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Verse 6. And Samuel was displeased with their request, and he went to the Lord for guidance. Samuel was upset when the people of God said, we want an earthly king instead of a heavenly king. When they said, we want a monarchy instead of a theocracy, we no longer want God to lead us, to judge us, to be our one and only. We want to have an earthly king. Why? Well, everybody else has an earthly king. We want to be like them. The more God's people become like the world, the less we become God's people. Does that make sense? We want to be... How much can we sin and still be God's people? That's what the church asks today. And, and this is what they're really saying to God. God, we're tired of your reign. You're old. You're outdated. You're no fun anymore. The other countries have cool kings, and we want a cool king. Verse 7, do everything they say to you, the Lord replied. Because remember, Samuel was upset that they rejected God. Samuel wanted them to continue to follow God. God says to Samuel, do everything they say to you, 
for it is me they are rejecting, not you, Samuel. See, sometimes my feelings get hurt when people leave and go to another church. I don't know why they do that. But I have to understand, they're not rejecting me. They're not rejecting you. They just see things differently. And when these people chose an earthly king over being led by God, they saw things differently. He says, it's me they're rejecting, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer, verse 8. Ever since I brought them out of Egypt, ever since I gave them food in the desert, ever since I gave them the promised land, ever since I blessed them and kept them safe, ever since all of that happened, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. So Samuel, do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. Church, we're just like Israel. Took them out of Egypt, led them through the wilderness, kept them safe, gave them food on a daily basis, led them into Israel, led them into Canaan. It was a land of milk and honey. And in spite of the blessings, they said, no, we're tired of following you, God. Don't we find ourselves in the same place? We have this amazing life. In fact, Jesus called it the abundant life. It has been given to us not because we earned it or by any means of merit, but God has given us this amazing life because he loves us. And we look at that and say, eh, eh, I'd rather go chase this instead. We're just like Israel. So what happens when you ask a king to be over you? Big government begins. Are you upset about big government? You want to simplify things? Stop yelling at the Democrats. Stop yelling at the Republicans and start yelling at the people of Israel because it's their fault. Look what happens in 1 Samuel. Samuel tells the people, if you want a king, this is what the king will require. The king will require military service by all of your young men. The military will require financial and material support, and that will come from the people. You will be the people tending the king's fields. Your women will cook, bake, and serve the king. The king will take the best of your fields. He'll take the best of your vineyards. He'll take the best of your olive groves. One-tenth of your grain and grape harvest will go to the king. He will need your servants. He will want the best of your herds and flocks, and you will be in the king's debt. Who wants to vote for that? And they all said, sure. Sure. So big government begins with the children of Israel because they rejected God and wanted an earthly king. And earthly kings require support. A bureaucracy, no matter how big or small, needs its people to support it. So when you want to gripe about your taxes, when you want to gripe about programs, go back and read 1 Samuel 8, 10 to 22. And you'll see where it started. It started because we want a king and we reject God. So when you want a king and you reject God, guess what? There's a price to pay. And we're still paying it, aren't we? So, big government begins. Look with me now at uh, verse 10. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king. In spite of what it will cost us financially and in terms of our sons and daughters, in spite of what it will cost us in, with our grain harvest, our grape harvest, they said, we still want to have a king. We want to be like the nations around us. We want our king to judge us and lead us into bad, battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people said. God didn't need Samuel to repeat this. God knew what they were saying. Do as they say, God said to Samuel. Give him a king. Be careful what you wish for, church. Be careful what you wish for. Because God just might let you have it. And then you'll be in a mess. Do as they say and give them a king. And Samuel agreed and sent the people home. So, now we need a king. So, God leads Samuel to this young man named Saul. 
1 Samuel 9, chapter, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Now there was a wealthy and influential man named Kish. I thought this was funny. Because why do politicians always come from wealthy and influential families? You ever notice that? You ever wonder where that started? It started right here. It wasn't, there was a poor man who was barely getting by. He had no influence whatsoever. And his son became king. Wasn't, you know, wasn't the son of a peanut farmer that became president. There was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin, verse 2. His son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else. So we're already voting on looks. We're already voting on pedigree. He's Harvard trained. He was the state attorney general of Georgia. He is a good man, head and shoulders above the rest. And we're still picking them based on the way they look in their pedigree. Started way back when. So one day some donkeys went missing. (laughs) Now some of you thought that this has an allusion to the Democrats. It doesn't, so I just want you to know. One day some donkeys went missing. And Kish sent Saul and a servant out to find the donkeys. Chapter 9, verse 15. Saul and his servant are out looking for the lost donkeys. They can't find the donkeys, so they said, let's go see the prophet Samuel, see if he can tell us where our donkeys are. Chapter 9, verse 15. Now the Lord had told Samuel the previous day, about this time tomorrow I will send a man to you from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him to be the leader of my people Israel. He will rescue them from the Philistines, for I have looked down on my people in mercy, and I have heard their cry. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said, that's the man I told you about. He will rule my people. Do you see the graciousness of God in these verses? The people rejected God, but yet in verse 16, God hears their cry and still has mercy on them, and God picks the king for them. You've rejected me, and God's feelings are definitely hurt, but still his grace and mercy come through to his people. And notice the responsibility that he is placing on Saul. Anoint him to be the leader of God's people. He will rescue God's people from the Philistines. And when Samuel saw Saul, he said, that's the man I told you about. He will rule my people. Isn't that a big job? You know, it's one thing to be the coach of a soccer team. It's something else to rule God's people. God's people, his possession, his chosen ones. And now he's entrusted that to a single man? I'd be scared to death. So, Samuel, or Saul says in verse 20, or actually Samuel says to Saul, and I'm here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all of Israel's hopes. And Saul replied, or Saul replied, but, but I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribe in Israel. My family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking to me about being king? So we see in Saul that he was a humble man, unlike our politician friends today. Saul was a humble man. Why why are you talking to me like this? Well, before Saul left home the next day, they went up and worshiped God together, and Samuel threw a big feast for Saul. And then in chapter 10, verse 1, it says this before Samuel went back home, or before Saul went back home. Chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it over Saul's head. He kissed Saul and said, I am doing this because God has appointed you to be the ruler over all Israel, his special possession. You know, we kind of have the same sort of situation as Saul had. Even though we haven't been anointed to be king of God's possession, we have been anointed and entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That life-saving message, that bridge from unholy man to a holy and righteous God has been entrusted to us. Just like 
Saul was given possession of God's people, God's holy people. Saul ruled them well because they are God's people. Church, you have the words of life. You have the way, the truth within you. Now guard it and share it with others. Oh, we have, we, we, we have a, a great responsibility just like Saul did. So, Samuel then prophesies about Saul's trip back. Look with me at chapter 10, verse, chapter 10, verse 5. Saul says, or rather Samuel says to Saul, when you arrive at Gibeah, you will meet a band of prophets coming down from the place of worship. Verse 6, at that time the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you and you will prophesy with them. You will be changed into a different person. Does that sound familiar? When you come to Jesus Christ, behold, all things become new. The old things pass away. Saul has had a transformation experience with the living God. He is now a God follower. You will be changed into a different person. So here's the question. Are you changed into a different person because of your encounter with God? Verse 7. After these signs take place, do what must be done, Saul, because God is with you. Then go down to Gilgal ahead of me. I will join you there. We'll sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. But Saul, you must wait seven days until I, Samuel, arrive and give you further instructions. And Saul turned and started to leave. God gave Saul a new heart. God gave Saul a new heart to govern his people well to be responsible and obedient before the Lord. And next week we will see Saul forfeit all of that. But you know what, church? God has given us a new heart. God has given us a new heart. And we, like Saul, are to be responsible, we're to be obedient, and we are to handle what He has entrusted to us with great care. And sadly, through our foolish choices, we forfeit what God has given to us. So Samuel meets Saul. Now Saul becomes king. First chapter, or first Samuel chapter 10. When Saul returned home, all of his family said, Saul, how did the trip go? Did you find the donkeys? Yeah, we found the donkeys. But he said nothing about his encounter with Samuel. He didn't run home and say, hey, guess what? I'm going to be the next king of Israel. Actually, I'm going to be the first king of Israel. Look, look, I, hey, Dad, guess what? I hope you're proud of me because I'm going to be the first king of Israel. Mom, I hope, I, I, did you hear this, Mom? All of a sudden, you're going to be the envy of the neighborhood. I'm going to be the king of Israel. Oh, good boy. Good, good boy, Saul. This is exciting. None of that happened. Actually, what happened is Saul kept quiet, and eventually Samuel called all of Israel together. Chapter 10, verse 19. And what Samuel does is he speaks for God. But notice the way he chastises God's people. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 19. Samuel is speaking for God. Though I have rescued you from your misery and distress in Egypt, though I have given you this land of Israel... You have rejected your God today and said, no, we want a king instead. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by tribes and clans. So there's 12 tribes of Israel. Within each tribe, there was a number of families or clans. Those clans were broken down into families. So they began to draw lots. So it wasn't the tribe of Reuben, wasn't the tribe of Manassas, wasn't the tribe of Dan, but it was the tribe of Benjamin. And they went through all the families. It wasn't this family, that family. Then they got to the family of Kish, and they found out it was his family. And then they went through Kish's sons, and the lot fell on Saul. The lot fell on Saul. Chapter 10, verse 21. But when they looked for Saul, he had disappeared. So they had to ask the Lord, where is Saul? They had to ask God, where's Saul, our king? Where is he? And the Lord replied, he is hiding among the baggage. So they found him and brought him out, and he stood head and shoulders above everyone else. And Samuel said to all the people, this is the man 
the Lord has chosen. Who chose Saul? Tell me. Who chose Saul? The Lord. It's important to recognize this because even those people God choose, chooses can go sideways. And there's a lesson here for you and I, not for this week, but for next week. God chose Saul. So far, so good. So far, he's humble. So far, he's a man of God. So far, his life and heart has been changed for the better. This is the man the Lord has chosen as your king. No one in all Israel is like him. And all the people shouted, Long live the king. Verse 26, chapter 10. Then Samuel told all the people what the rights and the duties of the king were. Remember, your sons are going to be in military service. The king's going to take one-tenth of your harvest. The king's going to need some of your herds, your animals. The king will have to support his kingdom. And you, the people, will pay for it. So Samuel told the people what the rights and the duties of the king were. He wrote them all down on a scroll, and he placed them before the Lord. Then Samuel sent the people home again. So like in every political situation, there were some people that were very happy. There were some people that weren't happy. Verse 26. When Saul returned to his home at Gibeah, a group of men whose hearts God had touched went with him. But there were some scoundrels who complained, how can this man save us? How can this man save us? There were detractors to God's chosen king. Who would be against the person God chose? How ridiculous is that? God chose this man, Saul, to be your king. And some of the people had the audacity to stand up and say, God, that was a stupid choice, and we're not with you on this. But yet Christians do that every day. God calls us and leads us and blesses us and directs us and guides us and leads us into all good things. And we sit back and go, huh. I think I got a better idea, God. I want to do this. And we do that. So, not everybody was happy about the man God chose. So, what do we need to learn from what we've seen today? Worship team, you come up. We need to get ready to finish up here. So, as a result, what should we consider looking at this historical passage, this passage of history, of history? Of history. What do we need to learn? Well, last week I told you that Winston Churchill said, Those who fail to learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. So here's what I want us to see. First of all, here's the question Which is it for you? Is it God alone or a compromising faith? Because the children of Israel tried to have it both ways. So the Israelites got rid of their images of Baal and Ashtoreth, and they worshiped God alone. Remember when Samuel led the people in revival, and they got down prostrate before God, and they cried out to him and said, God, we will serve you and follow you, and revival came to God's people? Well, it was only a short time after that. They said, God, give us a king. So which is it, church? Are you following God, or are you got one foot in your agenda and one foot in God's agenda? If you said yes to God, then say yes to God. If you're going to shake your fist in your face, in his face, then do that and go do something else. Don't try to walk both sides of the road. The children of Israel, oh yes, God, we want to follow you. We confess our sins. We'll stop worshiping the other false gods. We're all yours, God. And then a few months later, hey, God, we're not so happy with the way you're running things. Can we have a king? They've got that problem, and guess who else has that problem? We have that problem. So which is it? God alone or a compromising faith? Because if it's not God alone, then it's automatically a compromising faith. Secondly, what we need to learn from is that Saul said yes. What about you? God, I'm the smallest guy, 
in the smallest family, in the smallest tribe of Benjamin. I cannot be the guy. And God said, yes, you are. And Saul said, yes to God. What about you? Will you, have you, said yes to God? The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, Saul, and you will prophesy, and you will be changed into a different person. And God gave Saul a new heart. Say yes to those things if you haven't said yes to those things. And then live accordingly. And then thirdly, is there still some scoundrel in you? Is your heart still got that little piece of your agenda there where you look at people in the church, you look at the things of God, and you roll your eyes and say, yeah, well, yeah, well, you know, you know, Randy Robbins, he's not really all that. A little bit of scoundrel in you. Yeah, well, community church, a lot of flash, and, you know, Pastor Conrad's had some problems. Is there still some scoundrel in you? Oh, well, you know, down at Susanville Assembly, they, you know, that's a good church, but what is keeping you from being excited about God's work in the kingdom? What's missing in your life that you have to hold on to that 1%, that 2%, that 5% of your agenda instead of giving it all to God? Don't you see that that is always the best answer? Always. 100% given to God. Because, church, he didn't die for you 51%, did he? So stop giving him 51% of your life. Because in you and I, there still might be a little bit of scoundrel. Father, now my prayer is that we would hear from you. Father, I don't know what changes we need to make, what we need to address in our life. <laughs> but God, help us to stop worrying about what we're going to do as soon as we get in the car and head for lunch. Father, help us not to watch the clock and worry about what time it is. But Father, help us focus on the truth of your word. Are we living the life you've called us to? Are we the people that you desire us to be? And if we're found wanting, then God, may today we change that up. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing with Randy. The altar's open.